Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to Episode 68, Mirko Macaroni Lives to Inspire. Here's a shout out to listeners in Ohio, specifically in Columbus, Marysville, Mainville, Dublin, Reynoldsburg, Cincinnati, Uniontown, Sunbury, Chagrin Falls, Hudson, Versailles, and New Albany. With that, let's get started. Live to Inspire. This really describes Mirko. Whether coaching or leading an international brand campaign, Mirko helps clients and colleagues grow and develop and helps them contribute to society. As N.J. Colin Liu writes, Mirko is an inspiring marketing leader, always guiding the team to the best possible results. While Mirko is an entrepreneur, marketer, and public speaking coach, he is also a giver. His colleagues describe him as dedicated, passionate, and hardworking. Marco is the CEO of the Mastery Hub, which is the world's first digital coach consulting platform. And you'll find the link in the show notes to learn more about the Mastery Hub. It's really interesting. Speaking of interesting, you're going to learn about an app called StorySign, which is this incredible application that enables children and parents to read and sign together which I think is also worth checking out. Part one, pitch day. In my books, I talk about seven principles of leadership. And one of them is connect with others. With that is a belief that goes like this. Being vulnerable and getting to know others builds trust and relationships. Mirko talks about something even more foundational than this concept. He talks about just sharing and how that affects relationships and the dynamics of a meeting. Here's Mirko with his story. At the time, I was responsible for the marketing of a big tech Fortune 50 company. It was a beautiful rainy day in London. And I was asked to host and moderate a pretty rigid corporate meeting. It was what we call in marketing and advertising pitch day. As the client, we were going to assign one of probably the biggest advertising campaign of the year. And we were going to assign that to one advertising agency. So we had six to seven advertising agencies coming from all over the world to London to pitch their project. And they were all in a room. So imagine that. The tension was extremely high. It was a pretty rigid corporate environment. And as I was approaching myself to start introducing the team member, I thought, how could I transform the tension into empowerment? How could I change the atmosphere of this meeting? And as I was thinking, I had a great idea. I said, what if instead of just asking for each person to present themselves, I'll ask a very simple question. And the question was, what are you grateful for? And I started by saying my name, presenting myself and saying, today, I'm extremely grateful. And I listed the reason why I was grateful. So I mentioned my partner. I mentioned my love of being in nature. I mentioned the love for my mother. And I said, would you mind if each and every one of you would say, what are you grateful for? As you can appreciate in a corporate environment, at first, I had a lot of people looking at me in a little bit an awkward way. But as we started going one person after another, the energy started to change. Because basically, what happened is we build a level of compassion and empathy in the room. Everyone, it was getting to know each other. Everyone was reminding each other that we're all human. And being a great leader means being a great human in the first place. What was supposed to be a rigid corporate pitch became a manifestation of collective wisdom and appreciation. You know, great humans providing great values and enriching themselves while also sharing who they were. That was sensational because at the end of the meeting, I had quite a few of them saying, thanks so much for making us feel at ease. We were so tense about this meeting. And that is an app, the whole thing. It was pretty, pretty wonderful. Have you ever been in that situation, Gary? I think about it from not from that type of a perspective, but thinking about a team meeting. 
and it could be small within a company. You could have a group get together and just talking. What tends to happen is the manager takes up most of the time doing the talking and the direct reports do most of the time listening. But as soon as you do something like you did with the pitch day meeting, it opens things up. It gives, in a sense, people permission to express themselves freely, but getting to know one another beyond the corporate sense, it makes it safe for you to be able to express yourself more freely. Absolutely. And it was a wonderful way to harmoniously plan the different values in the room. Because effectively, all the people there, it was at first a separation between the client and the actual agencies. And that barriers that was there at first had completely crumbled to what's very important in the first place, being human. You just said something which I think really captures it, and that is the word barriers. If there are barriers between groups, and it could be anything from political barriers, social barriers, et cetera, then you can begin to remove those barriers by, just as you were saying, humanizing, or allowing people to humanize and express their commonality and shared humanity. It changes everything, and those barriers begin to slowly fall down and, and become not a barrier. Absolutely. It almost becomes a way of supporting each other because when you get to know someone and you get to know uh, things that you never expected, then also that kind of brings to life a conversation at first. A lot of people say, oh, wow, I didn't know you were grateful about going fishing. I love fishing. And so many other ways they kind of can lead They bring the conversation somewhere else and remind ourselves who we are and what we're grateful for. And developing those connections, it really humanizes us to make it easier for us to interact, communicate, and find even more common ground. Absolutely. Part two, story sign. Part of the principle of connecting with others is about a willingness to try to understand who people are, where they're at, what their likes are, what motivates them. It's this concept, the willingness to understand others, that makes this story special. Here's Mirko to explain. Let me start with a question. Okay. How do you lead when you cannot rely on the power of verbal communication? This story taught me how to do that. When uh, I moved to Australia, I had created back with a wonderful team for the company I was working with a revolutionary free app called StorySign. StorySign is an app that takes words from selected books and turns them into sign language, helping thousands of deaf children and their parents to read and sign together. It is completely free and downloadable from any app store. Here is the thing. As I was creating and bringing this app to life in the UK, I had an opportunity to move to Australia. And when I moved to Australia, I realized there was a massive opportunity to empower sign language in Australia. Unfortunately, I was way behind the time schedule compared to the other countries that brought this app to life. So my boss at the time said, Mirko, you need to find a charity because we're doing this for helping and empowering people. So I was on a mission to find a charity that could support to bring to life this project. And I had pretty much a, a week to do that. So as you can appreciate, charities are no startups. It takes very long time. Yeah. I started reaching out to a few charity when I found a charity called Deaf Australia. I reached out to them and said, look, this is a wonderful opportunity. We want to really empower and bring to life this app here because we believe in the power of sign language. The CEO came back to me a day later uh, after I'd reached out to two to three charities and he said, Mirko, this is a wonderful idea, but your timeline is impossible. We are a charity. We are not a startup. We won't be in a position to give you a response of whether we would like to be part of it in uh, two days. And I said, well, I understand that. However, what he said is, I do have a board meeting on Saturday and at the time it was Thursday. And I said, well, do you think it would be possible for me to fly over 
to Melbourne. I was in Sydney and to present this myself. And he said, look, there is no problem at all. But please do bear in mind that we are all deaf. You will have to find an interpreter and structure the presentation in a different way as uh, we cannot only rely on verbal communication. And, you know, at that moment, uh, as a public speaker myself, I was really pondering, how can I put myself in the shoes of uh, this situation? How can I find a way that not only will bring to life something correct, such as this app, but also will show what a great leader really means? And as I was pondering, one thing popped into my mind. And being a great leader means being adaptable. Sometimes we need to change our strategy. And in that case, I really had to do so. So what I decided to do is, together with my boss at the time, I built a very visual presentation. And that night, I spent the entire night basically preparing and learning sign language to introduce myself and some of the slides where instead of using verbal communication, I use sign language. I spent basically eight hours preparing. My sign language wasn't perfect, but that did not matter because in the moment when I started the presentation and in the moment where I started signing instead of using verbal communication, right in that moment, I created a connection. I had once again crumbled another barriers because they not only felt understood, but they also felt empowered by someone willing to basically understand them at a completely different level. It was extremely hard for me because effectively, I always been used to verbal communication, but putting myself in these shoes has just basically changed completely the environment. I also was extremely lucky because I probably found the most wonderful people in the world. Not only they were super compassionate, they understood that my sign language wasn't as great as I thought, but thankfully uh, through the interpreter and through my sign language I learned overnight, I managed to deliver the presentation on a Saturday and by Monday we had the approval of the charity coming on board and we launched Story Sign in Australia helping thousands of people of uh, children and families bringing back the bedtime story. That was one of the biggest uh, and probably proudest moments of my life. There is so much to unpack in this wonderful story. One is being adaptable. There is so much in corporate America where it's all about strategy. There's a book called Prime to Perform where they talk about tactical formants, and that is doing tactics that move you towards your strategy. But there's so much dynamics in life. There's so many variables that you cannot account for them all. You don't have all the information at once. The authors say you need to use what's called adaptive performance, which is deviating from your strategy to account for changes in the environment. And it sounds that is exactly what you did here in this situation to be able to appear before the board and move them to join your cause. That's absolutely spot on because that completely shifted the environment. Uh, they felt understood and that also removed the barriers and kind of uh, generated a constructed harmony. As I got at uh, one point quite emotional as I was showing the videos of other countries and other life being changed by this project, a lot of the people in the room actually started being very touched and it got very emotional and we felt united, which was an incredible feeling. There is a lot to be said with what you did in trying to use sign language yourself and learning it in a short period of time, even though it wasn't perfected. I can tell that the board just being able to empathize and appreciate that you respect where they are, their situation, and you trying to meet them where they are. It makes such a difference. Well, yeah, absolutely. Probably that was the first time that I saw a charity taking a stand and speeding up a process that otherwise would have probably taken you know, a couple of weeks or months. But that was the right opportunity. And look, I think the lesson here as well from a leader is I could have just said, no, I cannot make it. I cannot come to Melbourne. It's an hour and a half flight. 
I believe that you can do it. And instead, I took a chance. And by going the extra mile, people will appreciate you going the extra mile to make an impact. And I think this is something extremely powerful as a leader that we have to remind ourselves that even though we are leading, we need to also remind ourselves that we should be the one to lead first. We should be the one to basically set things by example and uh, make big sacrifices because the rewards could be could be enormous. Yes, definitely. That is so much about leadership is stepping up. If you are a manager of a team and you want to build a safe environment for your team members, you have to step up and go first. You have to allow yourself to be vulnerable, to have other people be vulnerable. And that's, in a sense, is a type, it's just what the word says, leading. You're starting off, you're initiating, and you're making that change. And when you appeared before the board and you attempted the sign, you were stepping up and you were initiating that you want to connect and communicate. And with these board members who were just happened to be deaf and it made all the difference in the world. Beautifully said. Well, thank you very much. Three, the power of collective vision. Leadership isn't easy. There's a lot you have to learn to be effective at leading. Every once in a while, though, someone gives us advice that nudges us in the right direction. Marco has some advice that may give you that nudge. Here's Marco. I believe the only unlimited resource that we have in this world is a human potential. As a leader, we should nurture human potential and shift the way we act, we react, and we lead. Can I give you a couple of examples? Yes, please. Instead of um, leading the way, why don't you actually focus on inspiring the way? Why don't you focus on getting your team really inspired and find what inspires them in the first place? You remember at first in part one, I asked the question, start every meeting with what are you grateful for? I tend to ask my team during my meetings, what inspires you? Because if I understand what inspires my team, then I can create a collective vision, which is built upon inspiring them and also bringing and using and leveraging their great talent to build a collective vision for that company, for that business, or for whatever you do as a leader. So that's the one point. I do have uh, three more and then we can discuss if you like. Another way is, I don't believe in my way is the only way. I've been in a few companies where the leader was seen as, I do have the final words on whatever I have to say. I believe that a collective vision where everyone can join in is much more powerful. How do you build a collective vision? Do that both manually and do that in a way that people can really come and chip in. Get a simple big piece of paper and ask everyone, what's your vision for the future? And how we as a company or me as a leader, I can help you to get closer to the vision and bring it all together and create a roadmap out of it. Because building a collective vision makes people feel being part of something bigger. And there is nothing more powerful than make someone part of something bigger. Mm. Then I have the last two, which is instead of being solely money driven, why don't be impact driven? At the end of the day, what we've seen in this world is that money is important up to a certain point. A lot of people that kind of reach that status of being wealthy, they're not valuing their life through the lens of money, but through the lens of impact. So we don't have to be wealthy to do that. We can start implementing that daily life as a leader, shifting the conversation from money-driven impact to impact-driven or really changing people's lives. And the last very point is, as a leader, instead of being me first, shift that to people first because effectively the moment you change that people will not only follow you but will be with you inspiring along the way beside you to support you and to support each other in a journey to make them part of something bigger that is a lot to unpack (laughs) 
<laughs> Let's go back to human potential. And I'm going to give a twist to this and what you were saying. And let me know if this resonates or, or aligns with what you're trying to communicate. When you look at people on a team, you can measure their behaviors. You can observe their behaviors. And you can say this person and describe the person's behaviors. Very easy to do. But what you can't do is look at someone and assume that because I know the behaviors that this person does, I also know the person's potential. One is visible, you can see it. The other is invisible and unrealized. So it's so often that in companies and organizations where there is someone who is doing, say, administrative type work, but that person may have the potential to lead the whole company. It's so hard to to do. And I like how you say to shift to inspire the way and to find out what inspires them, because I think, and let me know if you agree, that it begins to open up the understanding of what the potential a person has. Absolutely. So that's exactly the point. I definitely have nothing else to add because you nailed it. Once we understand what someone is inspired by, then we can really be in full alignment. And I guess one thing that I've seen over the years in the corporate company is the fact that there is a lot of untapped potential because you have a plateau of people at your disposal. This is something that at a startup level, I definitely see less because, you know, in a startup, you probably will have someone doing different roles while at the meantime, finding the right roles for them. So I encourage a lot of leaders to be more inquisitive with their team and definitely asking a simple question. What inspires you? What's your vision for the future? And how do you think this company can help you to get there? Yeah, I think that's nicely stated. My way is not the only way, is the antithesis of micromanaging. It is beautifully stated. And if you're more experienced, we have a tendency to say, okay, if you do it my way, I know you'll get there. But there's an opportunity to enable other people so that they can find their way and you can be there the coaching and guide them along the way. I just love that phrase is, is that recognition is the way I do things isn't the only way. And there's other paths that could get to the same destination. Absolutely. I think this is probably one of the most important role as a leaders. We should encourage people to find their way. Doesn't matter if we are more experienced that we know more. Sometimes, and this is something that probably we learn every single day, the opportunity to apply knowledge and acquire new knowledge is infinite. It's just infinite, you know? We have an incredible opportunity to always learn something. So if we found our own way as a leaders, and if we love what we do, then we should encourage our team members to find their way and inspire their way. They don't know exactly where they're going. That means that they need to be more coaching, a be more support, have open conversation, build a safe space where you can actually talk freely, of course, by being respectful and still on point. Yes. To the other part of that is about the collective vision. If Mirko, if you and I were working together, and maybe one day we will, and I have a vision for what I thought the two of us can do, that's okay. But you may have some insight that could take it to a new level and open up a new perspective that I wasn't seeing. And together, you and I could build a vision that is larger than what I could have conceived and maybe larger than what you could have conceived. Exactly. This is exactly the power of collective wisdom by bringing wisdom together to empower one another of seeing potential, of seeing possibilities that we couldn't see before. Mm. So it's really about developing as well as you go together on the journey, developing the helicopter view of the situation, right? Sometimes I might be more creative, you might be more analytical, but what if we bring together and we create, we sit down and we build step-by-step step a vision that brings our expertise, our people all in one place. Without a doubt, I would say more impactful than just having one vision where you're only looking inside a box. Just be in the box. 
Yes. <laughs> no, just I don't like that. yourself in the first place. Definitely. Impact driven. That's another phrase I love. And then, of course, from me first to people first, it is such an important message. It is the quintessential essence of what leadership is. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about other people and helping them grow, mature, build their character, develop mentally and morally. And I think that is just a beautiful last point that you have made. And it's a good reminder for listeners what they can do to move forward when they interact with other people. Absolutely. I think the leadership, as you know, very, very well has changed over the year and it's keep on changing. Yeah. I've always been one of probably the biggest advocate of conscious leadership, because when you are conscious, when you are aware of your action, that you reduce the possibility of reacting or making mistakes. There is nothing wrong with making mistakes. It really depends on how big that mistake is. If you make mistakes generally, then that's okay. But if you become offensive just because you are a leader and you putting yourself first, then I don't think that's a great example of leadership. This is why I'm encouraging all the listener and a lot of people out there to shift again the conversation from me first I know more to people first we can only know more together because the moment that we come together and we share that collective wisdom our potential is infinite I love the concept of conscious leadership because it reminds me of myself when I started in a management role where I had no interest in leadership. I had just assumed I knew what it was. It was about being democratic to some way and allowing people to make their own decisions. But I wasn't conscious about developing my leadership and being aware are trying to learn what it really means to lead. And if someone is new starting out in a management role where they're in charge of other people and trying to get work accomplished through them, it's so important to raise your consciousness about what leadership is and what it means for you to be more effective. Not only that, but be more impactful to not only for those people, but it's a way of contributing society and making society a better place by just being more effective at leading and being conscious and aware and learning that of what it means to lead. That's wonderful, Yuri. And you came a long way from not being interested in leadership to inspiring thousands and thousands of leaders every day. So well done. My thanks to Marco Macaroni. If you'd like to learn more about Marco, go to the show notes. And if you have a question or comment, go to unlabelleadership.com, click the message icon, and leave a voicemail up to one minute. I'd like to thank those who contribute to the show. Your contributions help offset some of the production costs, which makes a difference because this is a volunteer service. Oh, by the way, We are very close to raising enough capital to purchase transcripts for all the episodes. So those who are hard of hearing will be able to have those available at some point, hopefully sooner than later. Finally, I'd like to thank you for listening. Until next time, lead on.